Does it matter mm-hmm. in this particular case uh, when it comes to international law? Does it matter if you are coming through a known port of entry or crossing at a what in the United States they would say is a, a non port of entry? So you're illegally crossing an international border, being taken across by groups or by by folks who are trying to take advantage of the situation. Does the international law distinguish between these two forms of showing up at a port of entry versus showing up and being sort of captured as you're trying to internationally cross where you're not So supposed. this is Brian, you've you've asked the million dollar question. My view is it so alienage is a slightly distinct element of the refugee convention. Uh just to be clear for your listeners for for you. My reading of the refugee convention is that, and I, again, I encourage you and your listeners when you have the time after to just read the Refugee Convention, to read the plain words. It's 46 short articles, all in plain English, you know, common sense English. Article 31 prevents the penalization of refugees very clearly um, arriving through irregular means. So it's, a, it's very much a safeguard for however you arrive the drafters of the refugee convention they they knew at the time very clearly and this is if you look at what's called the travaux preparatoire the negotiating history it very clearly uh, explains there was a consensus that no everyone understood that when you're forced to leave through persecution this is often done quickly you don't have the correct documents with you you don't it's not a, a you know a conscious thought well thought out and planned decision you're compelled to take flight you often don't have the right documents you often might have to arrive irregularly and the drafters of the convention were very keen to protect against states penalizing in this regard so imposing any sort of penalties now in the modern era the ideology has very much changed gone are the days of the Cold War when powerful states in the West had an interest in accepting refugees. After the Cold War, there were successive kind of uh, seismic shifts, particularly, I would say, particularly after 9-11, the securitization of our borders. Refugee laws, uh, refugee or asylum seekers, they were treated with a lot of suspicion. They became in common use, not through, you know, any statistical evidence but through politics itself the idea that asylum seekers were seen seeking to game the system somehow this idea of being an economic migrant as opposed to an actual refugee started to enter the, the wider consciousness and that's very much complicated the clear very much very very clear wording of article 31 um so that answers that part of your question mm-hmm yeah. Uh, so I think we've covered uh, some of the criteria uh, as internationally defined for refugee. We talked about uh, a legitimate fear. We talked about the definition, uh, loose though it may have been, of, of persecution. Uh, we talked about that that had to be a particular type of persecution uh, based on race, mm-hmm. religion, national origin, could be political in nature. And then we talked about the fact you got to be in another country in order for any of these things to apply. However, you got there. Are there other criteria within the convention? No, that's that's Article One A Two. And if you meet these criteria, you will gain refugee status. Okay. Now that's all obviously of was... at the hands of the decision maker. Right. Um, so I was going to say all of this is constructed in a post World War two world, much of it with the Cold War in mind, with an ideological split in the world between, we'll call it generally East and generally West, generally communist, generally Mm. capitalist. Um, And and obviously that starts to break down. The international order still has some elements of that, but it's a very different world now. I am curious about this idea of persecution and how it is truly interpreted now around the world. It sounds like there was some consensus when these rules and and treaties were written but today you go from one country to another and how they choose to interpret this and and the political pressures on them are wildly different um is there any true international standard that you believe judges are deviating from uh or is this so vague that it left that amount of interpretation that any given judge wherever they may be has wide latitude to interpret this 
as they see fit for their country, for their region, for that situation. To hear the answer to that question, simply click the link in the description of this video to access the full episode. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel for videos like this and subscribe to this show anywhere you get your podcasts.